Hello, and welcome to The Capital Conversation with me, Michael Heyman. Now, whether it's hosting Nelson Mandela's 90th birthday celebrations with Will Smith, or challenging the media industry to get its act together, my guest today knows a thing or two about what it means to speak out. Jun Sarpong is a campaigner, broadcaster, social entrepreneur, and the co-founder of Women, Inspiration and Enterprise Network. From tackling issues like diversity and mental health to taking on the big guns of Brexit, June has never shied away from tough conversations. But June, are you ready for the capital conversation? Welcome <laughs> to the show. Well, I'm happy to be here. This is going to be the toughest <laughs> conversation yet, Michael. Well, because <laughs> normally we would see you this side um, of the, of the desk doing the interviews. But increasingly we've come to see you as a social campaigner, yeah. an entrepreneur, yeah. somebody out there to make a difference. Tell us what life is like the other side of the autocue. I'm quite enjoying it the other side of the autocue to the point where I'm not as good at autocue as I used to be. I think Don't I worry, neither to... am I. <laughs> <laughs> I think I need to start practicing again. Um, no, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. You know, these are um, issues that I'm passionate about and it's just wonderful to actually be able to use um, my television platform to, as a launch pad to do other things. Yeah, so, I mean, because yeah. you very much see you as what one part broadcaster, one part social entrepreneur, mm. one part even political voice. I mean, yeah. how do you manage to sort of wear all three hats at once? Well, I think because this stuff is really sort of, uh, you know, this is what I'm passionate about. So I think it comes across as authentic, at least I hope it does. And in the area of politics, whether we like it or not, I think we should all be political because politics is something that affects us all. You know, I don't know anything about race car dra driving or what, you know, I'm probably calling it the wrong thing. It doesn't matter, it doesn't impact my life, but politics does. But if you, if you watch the, the TV, if you listen to the polls, I mean, most people are tuning out of day-to-day -day politics. Does that kind of, does that kind of, Apathy, does that, does that worry you that more people aren't like you, more people aren't out there campaigning? I think, th the funny thing is, Michael, I think until Brexit, that was the case. I think until Brexit, most people were apathetic and most people weren't particularly interested in the political process. But I do think that the, the last year and a half, or the last couple of years, has shocked so many people that they realise that they can no longer sit on the sidelines. They so have to. So we're yeah, all activists now. I think we are, more right. so than we've ever been. But you are clearly a very driven person. Where, where does that drive come from? Well, I think the drive comes from, I grew up in East London. I grew up in a, a very working class community. Uh, my parents were immigrants. Um, and the thing with our family was in Ghana, we were quite wealthy. We were, um, we, uh, my dad had, a, had a standing in the country and so on. Um, and then the coup happened and we were basically left with nothing. We had to so flee. So you knew what it was like to lose everything. Yes. You were very young when you yeah, came very over. Young but still old enough to know that life was different and so I think when something like that happens to you it just makes you very aware of the importance of good governance um, and it makes you really passionate about making sure that we hold our politicians to account. But, but if I was thinking about people that I would associate drive, mm. ambition, getting out there and going for it. I mean, you're, you're well up there. I mean, really? You, you, oh, absolutely. Oh, I mean, wow. you're, 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 you know, you're out there on TV shows, <laughs> out there on stages, making the case on a lot of these issues, yeah. a lot of the issues of our time right now. If you were to sort of think about what makes it tick, so you've talked about a tough childhood, but in terms of a lot of people having a lot of similar issues, mm. what actually activates you? What actually gets you out there to actually try and make the difference? Yeah, well, you know, because I think what makes me excited in the morning and want to get out of bed and actually, you know, go and talk to people and do this job is the idea of a framework where everybody has a shot. I know what it feels like to be told no for issues that have nothing to do with who you are as a person. Um, and I think that when we do that, we waste so much talent in society. So I'm in a really privileged position in that I am able to uh, speak to power, as it were. I do have access to people that a lot of people that come from my sort of background don't. And therefore, I feel it's important to use it. But you're fundamentally an optimist, aren't you? Oh, I'm yeah. an optimist. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. what drives the optimism? Uh, yeah, I think because I genuinely believe um, in the inherent goodness of people. I do. My experience, and I can only go by my experience, my experience has been the majority of people are good. The majority of people want to be better, want to do better. And so that in itself 
makes me hopeful for the future because even if we're getting it wrong if the intention is to try and be better then there's always hope isn't there and, and for people that are sat at home right now watching a show like this thinking I'd like to do some good I'd like yeah. to make some change yes what can you do what's the first step oh, you can that. take I think the first step is even something as simple as talking to your neighbors because so many of us only uh, interact with others that remind us of ourselves and so many people have people living right next door to them who might be lonely, who may not have somebody to call on, you know, who might need a little help or some advice and actually who might have something to offer you. So I think even the little gesture, if you look at, you know, without getting too serious, but if you look at Grenfell, let's say, mm. you know, if you look at what happened in that community, this community where you had so much poverty surrounded by unbelievable levels of wealth for you know, the wealthiest borough in our city and part of the reason that that was able to happen was because of the lack of interaction between those two groups because even something as simple as all of the issues that we later found out were raised in Grenfell had those people in that tower known the people at the bottom the people at the bottom know how to make power move right. they have the agency they know who you write the letter to all of those things I think it would have been a different outcome. Right, so those those are the practical grassroots yeah. things. Tell us about a digital world. I mean, does yes. digital make it more or less easier to get that Well, agency? I think in terms of digital at the moment, the problem is, Michael, most of us, we're in our own little silos, aren't we? If you look at social media, when you follow people who agree with you, you, you have conversations that are based on your opinion. I think it's really important to follow people who don't agree with you. And I suggest you follow at who least do, 10 who people. Who do you follow? I who's follow Nigel Farage. I follow Jacob Rees-Mogg. I was following Donald Trump, but it got too much. Even okay, I, so I was you, like, I can't so, cope. <laughs> so you can, even the optimist can, uh, even can the switch optimist, off. Yeah, yeah, I was like, I know. My hope doesn't spread that far. So, um, yeah, I follow a lot of people I disagree with. Do you think that in this world where you're, where you're seeing the, the, the powerful can be held increasingly yeah. to account? I mean, yeah. do, do, are the powerful listening, do you think? I think the powerful only listen when they have to listen. And I think... Do, do they have to listen right now? I think they do. If you look at what's happening in the last few weeks, you, we've seen so many revelations, whether it's the, the issues with um, uh, unethical practices in relation to our data, um, whether it's uh, in terms of um, how our, our democracy has been hijacked and hacked. I think there's so many things that have happened that actually real people are incensed by and are holding our politicians to account so therefore they're having to hold these power brokers to account but when a, a mark zuckerberg is is summoned by the dcms select committee they're, they're too powerful to get on the flight over here aren't they, not they, will, will, they will, not will they pay attention well, but even if it's not mark himself it'll be somebody serious from the company it'll be somebody very high up and i think the the point here is before our governments were probably too frightened to act where the big tech companies were concerned because they thought, oh, the customers will be angry and obviously their customers are the, their voters, are the electorate. But now the customer is saying, I don't like the way these companies are behaving and they need to change, otherwise I'm switching off. And if you look at the... So the customer can vote with their yeah. thing. Is, is there evidence of that? I mean, obviously Facebook shares dipped by yeah, 7%. Yeah, 30 billion, but, I mean, yes. So, so that's capital that's speaking. That's capital, yes. about the billions of people well, that I use it every day. I think you, well, should you look, they boycott it? Well, I think it, it's not whether or not they should boycott it. I think it's when you look at what's happening, they are losing customers year on year. So they themselves realise that they have to change. They realise. And in terms of the actions that they could undertake to re-establish public trust, mm. what, what, what could, what should they do? Well, I think the most important thing is to be completely transparent about what went on and to own up to whatever mistakes were made um, and then to change the policy. So it's a good time to hold the mighty to account. It's yes. a good time to be an activist. But you've also said that it's not a good time to be told you can have it all. Um, yes. In terms of, <laughs> in terms of the costs of this, yeah. in terms of, yeah. tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So this is in, in particularly in relation to women and families and children. Um, and I think in this in this instance, we do have to have uh, uh, perhaps slightly different conversations with women than we do have to have with men just because of biology until we're able to 
figure that so out. So frame that conversation yeah, for us. Yeah, so the, the conversation is about career and motherhood and the fact that there is uh, a biological clock and we haven't, science hasn't figured out a way to sort of reverse that yet. When it does, we won't have a problem, but it hasn't yet. And I think with that in mind, we should make sure that when we're uh, encouraging women to structure their careers, we also have them consider that there is a period of time with which if they want to have children biologically, then this is something they really should consider. Do you think, I mean, you said here, I'm part of a generation that totally put work over relationships. Yeah, I mean, is that totally. part of a, of a message that is pushed towards ambitious young women? I think they? that's a message that uh, with my generation, so I'm Generation X, we were the generation of you can have it all and you don't necessarily have to consider when to have it all because i believe you can have it all but maybe not all at the same time right so so for a new generation yes. we're going to go into break in a second but yes. what's the new message the new for message, a more realistic generation perhaps? the new message is you can have it all but make sure that you do it within the right time frame well we finished this first half right within the right time frame <laughs> hey. as well and when we come back we will look at the causes that june has devoted her life to we'll look at what it means to commit what it means to campaign and perhaps most of all what it takes to win we'll see you in a minute Welcome back. My guest today is the social entrepreneur and broadcaster, June Sarpong. June, now, I want to take you back to the early 80s. Ah. You mentioned growing up in East London. Mm. You grew up in a council flat in Walthamstow. Council. Council. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like the way yeah. you said that. Thanks very much. It's very authentic. The, council. A council flat. Yeah. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about the experience. Of the council. In term of, just in terms of what it taught you about yeah. social mobility. Because oh, what yeah. I want to know is that if you were growing up there now, mm. Oh. Is it more mobile or less mobile? Oh, wow, what a wonderful question. Um, so when I was growing up there in the early 80s, um, even though we were very poor, and it was, you know, now Wolfram's so gentrified and it's like the new hipsterville, but in my day... Well, the dog tracks now block the posh flats, flats, exactly. Right? Yeah. In my day, it was one of the poorest communities in London, but what we had was a real um, uh, sense of cohesion and a real community spirit, and everybody knew each other and we all looked out for each other. So for me, I had this real sense of belonging. So it was better then? I think it was much better. I had a real sense of belonging and I knew that there was a community outside of my family looking out for me and willing me to succeed. Um, and so I think that was such a wonderful foundation. So I would say actually for somebody growing up there now trying to make it into my industry, it'd probably be harder. So it gave me a real, a real, um, uh, just it was a real rock for me. I mean actually Andrew Neal has said something quite similar they'd be very it's very that the mobility just isn't there no not in the same way but what what, what is available Especially now for elite industries like media for, like. for sure but what is available now that wasn't available in my day is social media so you can create content and find your audience. And, and so there is now a lot of young talent who would never be given the right opportunity and wouldn't get through the gatekeeper's gates, as it were, um, but they're able to create content and find the audience themselves. Right, now, now this is just one of the issues that, that you've picked up in your, in your book, Diversify Six yes. um, Degrees of Integration. Yeah. Now, tell us a little bit about big book you mm. interviewed a lot of people yes. what did you learn about yourself in the process of putting it together well, so another one. Oh, you're good at this another <laughs> wonderful question i'm going to start copying your questions for my it's next interview <laughs> what did you learn about yourself well what well? i learned was that i had unconscious bias so as i've said a you know, moment ago i grew up in a very multicultural area i was always comfortable with difference that's one of the beautiful things about growing up in london um but what i didn't realize that I had gotten so used to the lack of diversity in my industry that when that was challenged, even I had to adjust to the status quo. So a few years ago, I was filming in America uh, to adjust to the status quo being challenged. I was filming a few years ago in America and there was a young man who appeared on set who was covered in tattoos. And it was the weirdest thing, Michael. I felt so uncomfortable around him and started behaving strangely as a result. And he could sense it, I could sense it. And so fortunately, I pushed through my discomfort and I went to talk to him and he'd had a really tough start in life, but our sound man had taken him on as an apprentice. Mm. And I couldn't help but think how hard it was going to be for this young man to make it if even I 
was uncomfortable with him. And presumably, I mean, you know, that's not a sort of character you wouldn't have met many times no, in life. No, and not many. So, so I would have met was that. Was it just something about the setting or...? It was just something about the setting because I wasn't used to somebody like him in that context. Right. If I was back in Walthamstow on the estate, on the council, that yeah. would have been totally normal. But in that setting, it was not normal to me. And... And it really did sort of completely... It was a shock to my senses, mm. as it were. I, I love the subtitle, The World is Separate Enough. It is. What, what brings the world together? I think what brings the world together is our shared humanity. At the end of the day, sometimes we do overcomplicate this stuff. At the end of the day, we're human beings and we all want the same thing, you know, which is somebody to love, somewhere to belong, um, a, a sense of purpose. And I think if we're able to find those points of connection and those points points of similarity mm. to at least be what draws us in, then we can celebrate the difference. Are there moments in life where it just all goes wrong, where actually what, you know, what, what keeps us apart is the things that, you know, obviously overtakes the stronger emotions of what might keep us together? Well, Are I there certain that, triggers I think, that divide? I think if you look at it, I think, unfortunately, most of the time, we are not being as unified as we should be. That's why we have the problems we have in society. And then what happens is if we have a, an economic downturn, uh, if people are feeling the pinch, all you need is a demagogue to sort of um, fuel those f f the, the flames of fear and then it then explodes. Now, you've, you've raised the fact that there is a huge mm. Economic cost yeah. here for discrimination. That actually, Huge. that presumably mm. is one of the great impetuses for business, yes. among others, to get something done about yes, it. Yes, there is. You know, I did uh, the, my partners on the book at Oxford University and the LSE. And the LSE did um, some research on the cost of discrimination, and that's 127 billion pounds a year. And the thing is, what we have to realise is the workplace can actually be the lab where we experiment with this stuff and get it right. And mm. I think if we're able to get diversity and inclusion right in the workplace, what happens is that it filters through to how we behave in our social lives and it also filters through in terms of what we want our politicians but to do. But how far does it go? I mean, I mean one, one sort of instrument is positive discrimination in terms of actually bringing that in, well, in, a, in an enforced way. Is that something to, that we should do? Is, well, is it that... Is it well, that big a challenge? Well, you know, the funny thing is a lot of people are really um, against uh, targets and goals and, and then obviously you've just mentioned quotas. But it's funny how we don't mind targets and goals when it comes to money. I mm. can't think of a business that doesn't have a forecast for how much money they want to earn by a certain time. Right, that's the carrot. But yes. Is there a stick? No, 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 no. So my point is... If we know that setting goals and targets works financially, why would we think that wouldn't work where people are concerned? Mm. So for me, I am all for goals and targets. And yes, in some cases, quotas, because if we look at what works, i.e. in the Labour all-female shortlist, it worked. And now we have all of these women helping our democracy. Is that something that the politicians should do something about? Could they bring quotas into law? Well, I don't know if we would bring quotas into law, but I do think we need to make sure that our equal pay legislation is actually fit for purpose. So I think that needs to be re-looked at. I mean, in, in the book, you raise, you raise race, class, disability, gender. Mm. Are, are, they, are they all... And, and sexual orientation. And sexual orientation. Are they, are they all um, treated in the same way? Is it all part of the same side of the coin? Or actually, does... It, is it treated differently in different circumstances? I think you need both. So I think you need to have an overview where you take an intersectional approach, of course, and that's got to be the sort of long-term goal. But then you also do need to look at each strand and have an ind individualised approach because the reasons are different for each mm. group. And, and awareness in, in each one of those segments, mm. awareness is better. Yes. In, if you certainly believe what you read and you look at the campaigns. Yeah. Um, how far have campaigners like yourself levelled the playing field, or, or to what degree are we right at the full I think, I think uh, we, we've tried, but I think there's still a long way to go, because when you look at all the data and you look at the research, society is still incredibly unequal, so therefore we, we haven't got anywhere near as far as we should. Right, one other issue that we haven't mentioned mm. there that's big on your watch mm. list is mm. Brexit. <gasps> yes. In terms of where we stand right now, you've talked about Jeremy Corbyn having a duty... He has a duty. ..to support and represent... The young, young people who voted for voters. him. Yeah. But mm -hmm. it's a done deal now, isn't it? We're, we're on the road. I it's going to happen. I don't know if the it is. is I don't know if it is, because I think 
we will only know if it's a done deal once we see the terms of the deal. And I think once Theresa May comes back with the deal, it's then up to the British people. I don't believe in a second referendum, but I do believe the British people should have the right to decide whether or not it's worth leaving the EU. Well, once we know what it really is. For you personally, in terms of why you got involved mm. with the Remain sort of, you know, side, why yes. you were such a sort of very visible face yeah. of, of it, what, what, what inspired you to sort of go really, really political, yes, if you will? Yes, because when I looked at all of the various outcomes, there was nothing that showed that leaving the EU would be better for Britain on any level. None of it. And if you look at the real concerns, the problems that people have with the EU, and a lot of those concerns are valid, those are concerns that we could continue to campaign on and put pressure on the EU over a period of time. So if you look at the costs in terms of the financial costs, if you look at what it's going to mean for Britain in terms of our standing in the world, and if you look at the options that have now been taken off the table for our young people, there is no way this thing was worth do, it. Do you think business could have spoken out more strongly about Brexit? I have to say, I thought British business were in general was terrible over Brexit. There were so many of them that were far too scared to actually in any way put their head above the parapet because they thought that it might offend some shareholders or whatever and also because they thought it was a done deal. The problem was everybody thought this thing was fine and you know Remain would win and then whatever mm. but actually now they're feeling it themselves. What, what could, what, what should they be doing now do you think? Well I think the most important thing that needs to happen is for everybody to understand what really will happen if we leave. At the moment, a lot of businesses are not being honest. They're saying, oh, yeah, of course we're going to stay. When we know they're not. We know that many of them are secretly already looking at um, office space in Europe and so on. Be honest so that British people really understand what this could actually mean for them. So it sounds to me like you've got loads of unfinished business, yes. lots of campaigns. To yeah. What's going to keep the June Sarpong energy going in terms of the next chapter because it feels like there's a lot of campaigning to be done. <laughs> there's right? a lot of campaigning to be done. I think for me what will keep it going is just having conversations and then looking at action that creates a playing field that is a little more level that allows all of this untapped potential to contribute to our society. And last question to mm. that untapped or last message perhaps yeah. to that untapped potential. Mm. What's next? What should people do? I think the next thing that people should do is who is the out, if they work, that is, who's the outcast in your office? Go and befriend them. And who is the outcast in your community? Befriend them. Befriend them. Yeah. Jean Sarpong, I hope we have become befriended Yay! today. Thank you so much for coming well, on the show. Thank you, Michael. That's all we have time for this week. And thanks to my guest today, Jean Sarpong, the campaigning social entrepreneur. It's been a story of what it takes to make a difference. The belief that there is a better future to fight for is what makes a campaign a tick. And there's always time for a story like this on the Capital Conversation. I'll see you next time. <laughs>